This is Wade. And this is Jen. And this is an Out of the Darkness Ministry podcast, where we read from God's Word, and we see how it applies today, and how we can apply it to our lives. Hello, and welcome. And on today's episode, we're going to be reading in the book of Daniel. And why in Daniel? Well, reading from the scriptures, we can see how much of a model of faith that he is. Especially for us today. Daniel was born at a time when King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire was on a pretty successful campaign of conquering the known world. And Jerusalem was on that list. When Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army came in and successfully took over Jerusalem, he had an officer enlist only the best and brightest of the Jews to come back to Babylon and work for him. And Daniel was part of this this exile. And then we can see Nebuchadnezzar as he's ruling this great empire that's taking over many different nations. We can kind of see Nebuchadnezzar being an embodiment of the world. And Daniel is being snatched up by the world. Yet he can remain true and faithful to God. There's something we need to look at when we go about our lives. You know, we work our jobs. You know, we have the 9 to 5. We we have kids. We, we have all these things. We live in the world. You know, we may live and operate in the world. But we don't have to be of it. And Daniel became an employee right in the king's court of Babylon. Yet he remained true and faithful to God. And with that, he became a light to those around him, giving others the opportunity to know and understand the true glory of God. And that's how we need to be today. You know, we may think we live boring, mundane lives, some of us, and we work our nine to fives. We go off to have these careers and all of these different things. But we have to put God at the forefront. We have to put God first in our lives and stay faithful to Him because if we don't keep our faith in God, then we can be swept away and become like Babylon. We could eat in the king's court. We can eat right at the king's table and there wouldn't be any difference between us and the world. But with Daniel, there was a difference. And though he operated right in the very inner workings of the world power, He was still true, and he was still set apart. Uh, A little something different this time, but before we begin, I want to mention something, um, and it's about the persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ that are in other parts of the world. The other day I was reading a story um, about a Chinese church that was uh, jailed because it wasn't recognized by the government. And so these these men and women are being persecuted for their faith. They don't want to go by the government standards of what Christianity is. They don't want to go by a government-approved you know, Christianity. And so their faith has caused them to be persecuted for that. We need to remember that this goes on in the world. We need to keep that in mind. And we need to take time out of our day and pray for these individuals, that they be strengthened, that they be lifted up, and that their light can shine, and that God can use that opportunity to soften hearts. And though persecution is a terrible thing. God can use that to further his gospel. So we need to pray that these people be strengthened and that they can be bold, that they be filled with wisdom, and that they be shielded from the fiery darts that the enemy is throwing at them. Genuine faith isn't recognized by the world. And those of us who still have the freedom in liberty to preach the gospel, we shouldn't take that for granted. We should still work while it's light 
And then when we hear of our brothers and sisters out there who are being persecuted, it should also light a fire in us to preach loudly and more boldly because time is growing short and there will be a time where that freedom and that liberty will be put to an end and then our faith will be tried and tested. So remember these brothers and sisters, keep them in prayer and preach boldly and more loudly and let's keep working even harder while there's still light. Now before getting right into Daniel, just to set the stage, I'm going to go back into 2 Kings and read a little bit about in chapter 24. Again, just to set that stage so we kind of get a feeling of what's going on in Daniel's area at that time and what, what brings all this on. So, still about Daniel, we're just setting the stage. Well, here we're in 2 Kings chapter 24. During Jehoiakim's reign, and Jehoiakim is another king that is installed by the pharaoh of Egypt, because he took the original king and imprisoned him and took over and made them pay tribute to the to the Egyptians, and he placed a a king in his place, and that's um, Eliakim, who's renamed Jehoiakim. So during Jehoiakim's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded the land of Judah. Jehoiakim surrendered and paid tribute for three years, but then rebelled. Then the Lord set bands of Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite riders against Judah to destroy it, just as the Lord had promised through his prophets. These disasters happened to Judah because of the Lord's command. He had decided to banish Judah from his presence because of the many sins of Manasseh. Now Manasseh is a king who ruled, and he practiced all sorts of sorcery, divination. He consulted with mediums, psychics, but he even sacrificed his own son in the fire. He was reinstituting the practices that Ahab did, that they had worked so hard to cleanse from the land. He brought those things right back, so Manasseh is this king who brought such sin back into the land. He brought the practices of the pagan nations that God had driven out beforehand, and he brought them right back. He had decided to banish Judah from his presence because of the many sins of Manasseh, who had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. The Lord would not forgive this. So the sacrifice of children and people goes on to say, the rest of the events of Jehoiakim's reign and all the deeds are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Judah. When Jehoiakim died, his son Jehoiachin became the next king. The king of Egypt did not venture out of his country after that, for the king of Babylon captured the entire area formerly claimed by Egypt, from the brook of Egypt to the Euphrates River. And it makes me think of, uh, you know, just when you're operating in the world and on a worldly level, you know, people who just... You know, you need to take a step back. You see people just devouring each other or trampling all over each other to get to the top or whatever it takes, you know, to get the thing that they want or desire the most. You know, and people can start becoming like pawns. And in this time when you get so powerful, you know, men in power, the nations just kind of become pawns. So we're still going. So I'm sure we're going to get to Daniel. There's a reason there. Just, keep, just stay with me. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan, from Jerusalem. Jehoiachin did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father had done. So he's carrying on the same thing. During Jehoiachin's reign, the officers of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came up against Jerusalem and besieged it. Nebuchadnezzar himself arrived at the city during the siege. Then King Jehoiachin, along with the queen mother, his advisors, his commanders, and his officials, surrendered to the Babylonians. In the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he took Jehoiachin prisoner. As the Lord had said beforehand, Nebuchadnezzar carried away all the treasures from the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He stripped away all the gold objects that King Solomon of Israel had placed in the temple. 
King Nebuchadnezzar took all of Jerusalem captive, including all the commanders and the best of the soldiers, craftsmen and artisans, 10,000 in all. Only the poorest people were left in the land. I'm reading this again, like I said, to set the stage. So we know Jerusalem, you know, these lands were, were set aside for God's people, right? They were to be set apart. And then we had these a series of kings that started doing detestable things. They started in doing that they had started to willingly remove that hedge that God has placed around them, willingly uh stray away from the path that God had set before them, willingly walking away. You know, we can look at things and say, Why did God do this and why did God do that? When really it's the people. The people are doing that to themselves. God's pointing out this natural consequence that's going to happen. Hey, if you stay on this path that I've laid out before you, here's what's going to happen. If you stray off, here's something else that's going to happen. It's not going to be too great. We always seem to want to go off the path for some reason. So when you have this land supposed to be set apart full of God's people who are to be set apart to be these, this oddity, this thing that all the other nations are supposed to look at, uh, in an awe and attempt to bring them all back to God, they, in turn, are doing some of the most detestable things, and then they're mirroring all those other nations that they're supposed to be drawing back to God, right? And then you have where Nebuchadnezzar, and I really see here how he can really represent just the world because he's conquering, you know, uh, all these nations in the known world, and he's growing in power and being just a real representative of the world, and we can see how when the world, when we start looking like the world, and we start becoming the world, then we can be consumed by the world. We have Nebuchadnezzar even, he's taking things that, that, that Solomon had put in the Lord's temple. You know, and we think to now, you know, we have Christ and we're the temple. You know, God dwells in a, a temple not made by, you know, human hands. And God created all of us and now he's, now, now we're that temple that God dwells in. But we, if we don't stay faithful and true, we can be consumed. We can let the world consume us. And then as we let the world consume us, it's going to ransack all those treasures that God left inside of us. Right? Mm. Nebuchadnezzar led King Jehoiachin away as a captive to Babylon, along with the queen mother, his wives, and officials, and all Jerusalem's elite. He also exiled 7,000 of the best troops and the 1,000 craftsmen and artisans, all of whom were strong and fit for war. Then the king of Babylon installed Mataniah, Jehoiachin's uncle, as the next king, and he changed Mataniah's name to Zedekiah. So we've set that stage, and in reading that, it's to show how when we start imitating the world, or we let the world in, and we start operating on the world's level that we we can be consumed by it and then and then we end up becoming a servant of the world instead of the lord so we're going to go into daniel here and i'm really you know wanting to read this it's just showing how we can be set apart how we can exist in this world we're we're living in the world we have lives a lot of us have jobs careers everything like that and sometimes we don't do anything to make ourselves set apart and we just f kind of fit into the mold when really god is asking us you know we may be in the world but if god is at the forefront of our minds if he is the one we have decided and willingly given up our lives to serve him then we can let him work through us and even though we may be working that nine to five we give others an opportunity and a chance to witness God's grace, to be able to speak about the gospel. In a way, we can exist in the world but not be of it. It is possible. And that's why we're going to be reading in Daniel. And then maybe as we read, we'll see what kind of treasures are in here. And then maybe we can really take away, you know, what is it? What can I do that's going to make me set apart from the rest of the world? Is there any difference between me and the rest of the world? 
yes, I have this faith, but can people tell? Do people know? Is there something different? Has my life changed at all? You know, these are questions that we need to ask ourselves before we become just so swept away by things in this world and just, you know, becoming a part of Babylon. Daniel chapter 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. Something important there. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim. The Lord permitted that. The Lord permitted uh, some of the objects to be taken from the kingdom of God. These people, they, they, you know, the kings and everything, they were at a point where they just didn't care. Um, and it makes me think about, you know, as we go about through life, you know, are there things that we've lost, you know, from our temple? Are there things, is there a fire maybe we once had that we've lost? You know, have we willingly gone a different path? You know, God permits this taking of these objects I mean, he permits it because the people have already made a choice of who they are serving, and it's not God. And God loves us so much that he's willing to permit you to make the choice of who you're willing to serve, the Lord of the earth or the Lord of heaven's armies, the Lord, I am, Yahweh, Jesus, the word, and we can get sad over the sacred objects being taken from the temple. But God knows. Again, they put themselves in that situation, but also God knows that those objects, they just became mere material things, unimportant in the long run, having nothing to do with genuine faith, and things that seem so important to us aren't really, you know, when it comes to God. He values faith in an earnest heart so much more. And that's what we could fill our temples with, an earnestness. You know, we may think we have lost something in the past, but it's not this thing that we have to strive after and try to get it back like it's some prized possession. All we need to do is get back in our relationship with Him. So the world can't take those objects from your temple. I mean, we need to get into a place where the world can't take our faith because it's not a material object. It's not this thing. We have to have that faith that is unshakable. They cannot be taken away. No matter what happens to the temple, to our bodies, whether it gets beaten and ransacked, the treasure and the gold of the faith can remain. And at that point, God permitted these things to be taken because they were just mere things without any kind of love, without any kind of faith being involved in that stuff. They're just things. Of course he's going to permit them to be taken. Yeah, because I think, you know, we need to recognize the difference between looking at the things that are here on earth and seeking the kingdom. Hmm. Because, like you said, those things were, you know, mere objects here on earth um at a time yeah they they held a uh, a value but god pride. yeah well yeah you know like a sense of pride in it too yeah and god is above all that so it's just really important to realize that yeah um we might have this or we might have that but is that the lord of our life or is god the lord of our life and are we seeking um, these carnal things, or are we seeking the spiritual things? And we're seeing a very like worldly action in play here, in that it was something, um, you know, a real show of, of dominance when you can, when a king can go into another land and ransack that other king's goods. You know, it's a very worldly type of thinking and mentality. These material things. God is also showing another aspect of humility as well. 
as we follow Christ, as we follow God, and we stay in our faith, we have to show humility as well. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. And like really showing out like his God. He placed these material things in the treasure trove, the place of his God. And his God is clearly one who is pleased with the gathering of all of these things, gathering of power and the gathering of worldly wealth and all this, all these things. And that's the God of this world. You know, this may be a terrible time for these guys. God's also sending them into exile as a refining process that we'll see. And a lot of times we go through a refining process. And it takes time for some of us to realize if we have strayed off, if we have um, gotten off of, if we've taken our minds off of the intentions that God has had in place for us, because we should be Christian first and then, right? I'm a Christian, a child of God, a follower of Christ Jesus, and an American, and whatever my career is. You know, with God being the, at the forefront of our minds and involved intimately in the decisions that we make in our life. This God isn't impressed with the things, material things we can accumulate or how much money we can accumulate or how successful we are in our jobs or how successful we are in our careers. What God is really looking for is how successful we are in our relationship with Him and how successful are we at letting Him flow through us, letting His light come out of us. Letting our will subtly die each and every day. How successful are we at letting him take over? You know, and that's a choice. Whether we want that or not. Each day we can hinder the spirit. Each day we can hinder. Because God, again, we have free will. And we have the freedom to make choices and decisions. Yeah, and I think that is, you know, the part of dying daily. It, of course, you know, God isn't going to be impressed with the, the um, like the things that we accumulate, because He is perfect, mm -hmm. and you know, nothing else is. Right. And so, why would things that we have, like our job promotion or you know the car that we have in the garage you know why would those things please god why would this um the stuff that can decay please and a perfect everlasting uh, yeah an omnipotent mm -hmm. you know like god mm -hmm. it just isn't logical you know right and then it goes back to right here i see a, a personality trait in Nebuchadnezzar, and you need a certain trait, whether it, it makes you decide you want to go and, and conquer the world, pretty much. But um, the fact that this accumulation of wealth and as a sign of power, and, and in a worldly way, the world recognizes that as power. Some of the teaching now in the church, which is really disturbing, is an accumulation of wealth or promotions or whatever can be a sign of, you know, uh, special blessings from God. And <laughs> yes, we get blessed from God in various ways, mm -hmm. but God... And he can bless, like, we can, in some of he, those he, ways. Yes. But, I don't want to sound like, when, no, like none of that is from God. Uh, the The problem comes in where the idea is you aren't uh, doing something right for God if you're not accumulating this wealth or if you're not getting those promotions, then you are doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. You are not, you know, a member of the kingdom or, or whatever. And, and, and that is insanity. That is such a worldly, that is such serving the God of the world because it's such a worldly mentality. And we know Essentially, who Nebuchadnezzar served himself, and he served Satan while he served himself. Yet we have uh, 
certain teachings in the church, and you know, name it, claim it, kind of things, and uh, you know, this idea of just kind of repeating certain scriptures over to kind of help us uh, gain some kind of uh, you know edge in in something, which really, when you when you look at it, is 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 a type of witchcraft, you know, saying a spell. You you know when you know witchcraft and and spell work and all that stuff is you're trying to manipulate uh, the universe, the makeup of the universe, to, and, and bend it to your will. Mm. When the very thing is, we are supposed to be submitting our will to God. You know, following Christ, right? That's that's dying daily, giving up your life. You know, the things in our will, you know, a lot of people have that ask and you'll receive and all these things. But what we fail to realize is, well, if we're living our life in faith and we're being transformed by Christ and our heart is being transformed and the things in our heart uh, start and and the things of our will, let's start becoming the will of the Father, the will of God. And the things we start asking for fall in line with the will of God. Therefore, it is granted because we are asking in faith and we're asking in God's will. We forget that. Mm-hmm. You know, we're thinking like he's this kind of you know, like magic genie person who's or a vending machine. And, <laughs> and, and that's just not the case. We really need to get back to dying daily. You know, reading in the scriptures, reading about Christ, reading about the disciples. None of these guys lived lavishly. And anyone... Anytime they had money or anything, it was to further the gospel. It was just a tool. It was a tool to get the gospel out further. And we've kind of taken money, we've kind of taken all these things as a means to an end, as this thing that we need to get and accumulate, much like Nebuchadnezzar and his conquest, much like any of these kings of the world, much like any of the past kings of Judah and and, and Israel. You know, when, when their God became the material things, then their ways, you know, started to, it all started to fall apart. Yeah, it reminds me of a a verse. I'm trying to find it real quick. I found it. It's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. And in the New King James, it says, Now this is the confidence that I have in him, that if I ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hear, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. So the key word in verse 14 is his will. So, as long as it's in his will, he hears us, that he hears our prayers. So are we operating under the our carnal flesh and wanting a new car or a new, um, a new house? Or are we operating under the will of God? Mm. Yeah, just reading in there, we could see kind of if we, in a way, are imitating nebuchadnezzar it's just things that we should look at we should always have the ability to self-reflect all right let's keep going then the king ordered ashpenaz his chief of staff to bring to the palace some of the young men of judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to babylon as captives select only strong healthy and good-looking young men he said Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. I was seeing something here where then the king ordered Ashpenaz his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. And it got me thinking about how now, you know, today, when we're in Christ, we are part of that nobility. 
We are um, sons and daughters of God. We are priests, and we're we're under Christ, who is that priest and king, right? And that, without sounding big-headed, we're part of that royal line. And in some ways, now people abuse that. Again, with the name it and claim it, kind of, you are royal. So you deserve riches, or you deserve blessings. You're owed it, almost, that kind of mentality. Yeah, and not really realizing how selfish that sounds, you know. Because that kind of, the whole, like, we're owed it, or you know what I mean. That kind of reminds me of, well, why did Satan fall? He wanted to be worshipped. He, you know, he... He wanted all that stuff. So <laughs> it seems like, you know, it's kind of that subtle, like, mm -hmm. pride. Mm -hmm. Pride yeah. and um, pride and just, yeah, just that self selfish instead of selfless. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting. We, we can see Ashpenaz, you know, this agent of Nebuchadnezzar. So, like, this agent of the world. Uh, going in and, and picking from the nobility or the royal line. Uh, and at this time, we, you know, we've described the state of the people. And so this would give these particular individuals most, not all, as we'll read, a sense of pride and something that can be played off in because they've just been taken over. But they're being taken in and being assimilated. Taking in, being assimilated, and becoming part of you know, of a different system. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to offer things that are going to entice this nobility, you know, these these people, and to help them better assimilate to his structure. And just like the world entices us, and though we're part of a, you know, royalty now in a spiritual sense, the world will try to entice us with many riches, many things that's going to get us onto its mm. kind of structure. Mm. So like how it was, it's like they are kind of pilgrims of Babylon because mm. right, Nebuchadnezzar is, you know, the king of Babylon. And so, yeah, I see how it kind of reflects us today. So we are pilgrims of this world. Like mm. this is not our home. But we're here. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, that's just really interesting. Mm. And and honestly, not not all of them are going to be like that later on. But we see they're going to be there for a generation for 70 years. Mm. Some of these people, like the people who were in the desert in Moses' time, had to essentially die off for a new batch, a new crop of people to raise up, a new remnant to be brought forth. So the shedding of all these people and, and, and the nobility of that time would have been probably pretty materialistic. We know how evil, how evil was so present, prevalent in the land, right? Another thing of God bringing these people here to, again, bring out a remnant, right? Picking, um, <laughs> you know, a new crop that's going to be born, you know, from this, from this bag because it's going to get shed. Mm. Yeah, and when you're when you were saying seventy, you know, like I, I know they were um, captive for seventy years, but what I was just thinking um, while you were saying that was, wow, you know, like the typical like lifespan of people nowadays is around seventy years. You know, there's people that live to be like a hundred and something, and people that are younger that you know pass away, but. Typically, people are around in their 70s. And wow, that's like another. <laughs> yeah, and God told them that they were, God already had told them before from the other prophets, you're going to be exiled. And when you do go into exile, have children, multiply, till the ground, you know, and it's mm. just, again to, to bring this new, you know, generation, this new remnant. Mm. So again, mirroring that kind of exodus account where the people that were with Moses essentially all having to die off and their children being the new batch to go in to the promised land. Those children weren't firsthand witnesses 
of the miracles that happened, like the parting of the Red Seas and the rock splitting open and the water coming out. They didn't see that firsthand. They were hearing the stories of it. So they had to take that on faith. And then they would go to the promised land. So much in you know, that faith component, how important that is. More so than the actual uh, event, you know, is the faith in the events. Again, uh, pretty interesting here where only the, the best looking people were chosen. You know, again, I think of just such a, a worldly uh, vanity type mentality there. I think sometimes we can do that on a subconscious level. Maybe maybe picking and choosing friends, not really no, noticing or realizing it's based on their looks or who we're comfortable around on a, but on a vain level. Just another, again, another kind of worldly construct going on here. So, yeah, the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. You know, following into that, worldly structure, again, the way Nebuchadnezzar's running things, you know, who are we captive to? The world or the Lord? And again, it's just all right there in the first little part we can see and look and gather that the world operates on a different level. Well, not a different level. On a different system than God. And places value on things that God does not care about. And places wisdom on things and people that God would consider fools. So here's the assimilation. I'll go down here where, you know, the king, well, it said, train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. So bring them in, assimilate them, right? And, and to me, or, you know, it says your literature of Babylon or the Chaldeans, I see, train them in the, the literature and the language of the world, right? The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. And it makes me think already, like, the food that we're supposed to get from our king, King Jesus. Right? Are we seeking after his food? Or are we seeking after that food? Are we being allowing ourselves to be fed by the king of this world? Because our development depends so much on what we consume. Our spiritual development depends on what we consume. Worldly food? Or what I think is worse, watered down gospel? Or are we getting that nutrient rich? food that only comes from God, that's reading his word, the whole word, on a daily basis. Do we take it in daily? Do we feed ourselves daily with God's food, God's word? Are we continuously consuming the mind-numbing entertainment and things of this world that are so wanting, that are so full of subverted messages that slowly accumulate in our minds. And eventually, if we don't, if we aren't prayed up, if we are not, if we don't have the full armor of God on, then those subliminal messages that the world puts in the, in the entertainment, the literature, the art, all of that stuff, if we aren't strong in the Lord, if there are cracks in our foundation, if our faith is in whole, then those ideas and things of the world get planted into us and they take root. And then they begin to crack apart and pull apart the faith that we may have once had. Mm. You know, we have to pay attention to the things we consume. And I'm speaking in a spiritual sense, on spiritual in, in a spiritual way, just like reading this gospel in a spiritual sense. I know and I understand what's going on, who it's written to in the time, but we're looking at this in a spiritual way, not reading into it, but looking at the spiritual implications of what's going on and how we can apply that to our lives today, because that's what scripture is for us. 
Old Testament, New Testament. It's all God's word. It's all Christ. We can consume it all and we can be nourished by it all. Second Timothy three and 16, read it. Absolutely. You know, uh, it is all meant for us to take in. Now that doesn't mean that we have to live by the old Levitical laws because Jesus came and he fulfilled the law and it's written on our heart, but there is lots of good lessons. There is tons of just good stuff to, there's tons of food that we could eat, spiritual food from the old Testament and the new Testament. And we have to recognize that it's all God's word and God's word does not return void. Mm. Absolutely. And so here we go. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. It's funny how there's a reversal here because God, you know, we become brand new. I think I read somewhere we get brand new names, you know, and just kind of the world, you know, it's going to rename you. It's going to rebrand you, make you into its image. It's kind of like this subverted, inverted kind of mockery of the way God does things, you know. Daniel was called Belshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. I have to ask myself, and I think a lot of us have to ask ourselves, how determined are we to stay true to God? You know, we can say big words, uh, and and we can be high-minded, and we can think, you know, I'll never do this, and I'll never succumb to this, and I won't... You know, and then we can look at other people and the sin that they're in and be like, Psh, those poor fools, how could they fall into that? How could they do this and all this stuff? God knows us better than we know ourselves. Absolutely, because Peter, he didn't think that he was going to deny Christ. And he denied him three times. We don't know. We can say that we aren't going to do this and we aren't going to do that, but... The only one who knows is God. So that is why we need to stay prayed up because um, if we remember like when Christ was in the garden right before he um, uh, got betrayed, right? He, he was telling the disciples, pray because the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm. So if Peter would have, you know, prayed and not fell asleep, he might not have denied Christ. But, you know, who knows? <laughs> and we're seeing in a time here where, where law, written law, was important to follow. We got Daniel's faith in God gave him a determination to not defile himself by eating the food and the wine that is distributed by the king. The faith in God already made him stand out in a way where he was able to ask the chief of staff, so we're going to read here. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. The fact that someone even listened to the request is a miracle in itself. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age... I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. So Daniel had a faith so great and a love for God so great that it made him stand apart from the other people. It's interesting. We only hear about these four guys. There were uh, there was 10,000 others. I guess they assimilated fine. I don't know. We read, about, uh, we read later about Jehoiachin, the king he ate at the king's table. So he just ate what was fed to him. He didn't care. And he was appointed, you know, he's the son of someone appointed by Egypt in the first place. But anyway, so the the world is determined for you to work on its principles and its system by consuming the food it gives you. Nebuchadnezzar needed his staff to look a certain way, be a certain way, in order to serve under him. And the world, to an extent, it wants you to look a certain way, think a certain way, act a certain way, 
all those ways are contrary to God. Because as we read and as we know that this world is darkness. The food that the world gives out to us, the more we consume and the more that we let that inside of us, the more we let that control us, the more we let that stamp out the light. And then before we know it, we have that lampshade over the light. And then we're, we're in the dark too. And then everyone around is more comfortable because there's no light exposing the things that are going on. And some people are afraid of truth. Some people are afraid of that light. This person here, the king, is like, you know, if I if I don't have you eat this stuff, the king's going to behead me. You know, some people, you know, when they hear Christ, when they hear the truth, they automatically get afraid. They get scared. You know, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want people around to get offended. I go back to the to that office that I worked in where the women the the woman had all the scriptures and, and crosses and she's a very godly woman and she was asked to take that stuff down because it was offensive or and the managers didn't want anyone to be offended yet you could find Buddha you could find any other type of quote from anybody else but the minute had to do with Jesus or anything that had to do with Jesus need to be taken down because again he's the truth the truth scares us you know and those people who are used to being in the dark when they see when you're in the dark for so long when you see that little spot of light and you're so used to the dark you see that little spot of light bam it can scare it can scare you because you can start to see what's actually going on around it's like someone who's stuck you know I don't know who gets in a cave Right, and then they shine the light, and then they see all the bugs or stuff, something around them. And you're like, ah, and you turn out the light so you can't see all that stuff. You know, that's like God. You know, he he shines that light. You know, we shine that light around, and we can see all the filth and everything going on. And the first thing we want to do is ah, shut that out. Mm. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of like a little story. So, um, our son, he likes to sleep in a room that's completely dark. Right. And his TV has like this little teeny tiny, like red lights. And he complains because that red light, he said, is so bright at nighttime. Right. And what you were saying just kind of reminded me of that. So there's people, you know, that are asleep in this world, but you shine that light, even if it's like a little light, you know, it's going to hurt your eyes. Hmm. Like it's going to be like bright in the night mm -hmm. and it is, it should wake people up, mm -hmm. you know, and people don't want to be woken up. Mm -hmm. They want to sleep, be content and just relax. Mm. They don't want to, uh, wake up from this world. So, yeah. So we have Daniel here. Uh, already a great model of, of faith, right? He's being deported to Babylon. He's get, he, he's getting ready to be assimilated in a way into the culture, into the work and everything. But he knew God, and that came first. It didn't matter what was going on around him, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's like so many of us, you know, we enter the, the job, you know, the workforce, or we have some career in mind, or, we, you know, all this stuff. When we enter the world, you know, is God at the forefront of that? Do people know? Do people know that we are followers of Christ? Again, or are we just kind of blending in? And it goes beyond, you know, clothing. I'm not, you know, you don't need to dress in solid colors and always wear a skirt or, you know, have your hair in a bun or, or not wear... Makeup or all these things, God tells you that you don't need all these things to look beautiful or be nice because he looks at the heart. But again, it goes, it goes beyond that. Even, even when individuals try to, try so hard to not, you know, fit in the world by like wearing a, only a certain type of clothing or whatever, and, you know, in that way it can be a type of vanity. You know, when you read in Ecclesiastes, everything is vanity. It needs to go to the heart. You know, why? Why are you? choosing the things that you're choosing why are you putting on the clothing that you're putting on why you know again you know mm -hmm. the answers to these things and the questions are so much deeper than surface things and again with anything you get risk the danger of just becoming religious about it and i say religious in a just performing a set of rituals mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. uh, without any kind of faith, without any kind of love. You know, sometimes it's like, no, I only wear, you know, I don't wear any shirts with logos on them because it's evil. And uh, I don't do it because I, I just don't. And then, uh, but is there love in that? So for some people, hey, they love God so much. I'm I'm not going to, I choose to, I don't know, not I, I'm wearing this as a symbol of my love. Yeah, so kind of like uh, like how we fast for things, right? Right. So it could be kind of like, you know, that. Well, I'm going to wear this because I, even though I enjoy this type of clothing, I'm going to wear this. Mm-hmm. But there is, like you were saying, are you doing it because of your heart? Or are you doing it because you want other people to look at you and be like, oh, they're religious. Mm. Right? Because mm-hmm. I know a few people like that where... You know, they wear certain things and I'm not meaning all of them. I'm just meaning like I I can think of a few mm-hmm. where I know that they do that because they want to look a certain way so that people will be like, oh, you know, they're religious. And, but really, it's your heart. Right. Are you doing it because you want to and you want people to look at you or are you doing it because you love God and you just want to do this for him? Mm, mm. And that's the thing here is, and that's why I felt so strongly about reading in Daniel. You can imagine he was wearing Babylonian garb. You know, you can imagine he's, but somehow his, his faith is going beyond that. His faith is surpassing all of these little things that today, you know, we nitpick and we go, you know, wear this, don't wear that. You know, and there's some common sense things uh, that we shouldn't wear. But then, you know, uh, again, it goes so much deeper. Get the tattoo, don't get the tattoo. Yeah, get the piercing, don't get the piercing. Again, it, the question goes beyond that. Why? To the why. Asking the why. Where is it coming from? How does it glorify God? Again, and then people on both sides who want to go, you know, you should never uh, get tattoos or you should never wear this type of clothing or you should never do this and and then but there's no love behind that and then there, you have the other side who is like i'm gonna do whatever i want because i got i'm free i got grace and i got all this stuff and so i'm you know and then they're essentially abusing that grace because of their lack of love so you have both extremes where uh, there's a lack of love and they're just following a ritual and then there's a lack of love and they're trying to do whatever they want because they think they can absolutely <laughs> absolutely i it's a heart issue. You it know? is. It's a heart issue and it's a faith issue. Like, are you doing it because of, you know, your love for Christ, like we said, or are you doing it because you want people to look at you a certain way? Yeah. <laughs> 11. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please, test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. Test us on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. And then I've noticed, like, we haven't even talked about, like, whether it's unclean meat or whether it's, like, there's so much deeper going on here. Yeah, there's probably unclean foods. Maybe there's a bunch of shellfish. I don't know. (laughs) Something that would make Daniel think, I am... Uh, compromising with with God if I do this, if I participate in this. And that's, again, and it's different for different people. And again, it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the faith. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So already living a life of faith is much more <laughs> nutritional. My little quote signs up nutritional than than the world. And it's even though it may be contrary to popular uh belief according to the world, if we stay faithful, we can remain strong and that will show an outward appearance, whether in our actions or, or whatever, someone will notice. And that's what we're getting at here. They looked more nourished. They looked healthier. The more time we spend with God, getting to know God, getting, you know, getting that understanding, getting that wisdom, uh, 
feeding ourselves daily, nourishing ourselves in his word, spending that time, the more nourished we're going to get, the healthier spiritually we're going to get, the more firm and have a better foundation in the faith we'll have. And again, more of that will be on display. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God can do that for each and every one of us who are faithful to him, who have an earnest heart, who are just seeking after him. You know, when we read, it should be a spiritual experience, and we should be gleaning something out of it, something spiritual to nourish our souls. And we can ask God, like Solomon did, to give us wisdom, to give us knowledge so that we can apply it in our lives and we can be that living witness to Christ. And God gave Daniel this special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. Okay, I'm going to read that one more time. God, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. And as I read that, that reminds me of Paul speaking about spiritual gifts. I'm going to go over here to 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. In the fourth verse, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. That same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. Uh, we can go on. He gives one the pers- one person the power to perform miracles, another the ability to prophesy. But that whole, God gives the wisdom. Mm-hmm. God has the knowledge. God gives us wisdom. And that's a spiritual gift. That is a gift from God. Mm-hmm. And we see it all the way back here. You know, God is giving these men understanding. And what is the beginning of understanding? What's the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. <laughs> yeah, and I think another important thing, you know, like you were saying, it's God that is giving this. God is giving the wisdom. He is the one that gives the spiritual gifts. It's not as we will them. It's as the Lord. Mm. So even the people that operate under these spiritual gifts, it is not their ability, but it is the Spirit of the Lord who is doing this, not the individual. Right. And so as we go about in the world, the greater faith we have, you know, the greater understanding, the greater wisdom, and you know, the better we can apply it to our lives and the better we can imitate Christ. Be a Christian to imitate Christ is what that word means. And then we could look and be set apart even more, causing those around to look at, to, to, to look upon us as this oddity. But again, like, like Israel was set apart. You know, the Jews were this nation set apart with all these different laws and customs, this kind of oddity that all the other nations were to look upon. But it was God's way of drawing people back to him. Mm. Well, in the way, we're doing the same. That oddity, that thing set apart, that we exist in the world, not being of it, but so that we can be looked upon. And yes, most people will revile you. But we're also part of God's mercy and giving people the opportunity and chance to experience his love. Right. And, you know, speaking of that, like being looked upon, now we need to also understand that it's not that we want people to look on us, but we want them to look at the God that is in us. Right. So not us as like this vanity like no. thing. Mm. It's not us, but it's 
we want to ref- we want Christ to shine out of us, mm-hmm. and that's what we want someone to look at, not our flesh and blood, but the Christ that is in us. You know, nothing of us, all of God, the Spirit. You know, of- <sighs> mm. when the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. And no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. And whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in the entire kingdom. Mm -hmm. If God is at the forefront, you know, of our thoughts, of our minds, if he is the one that we serve, even though we are doing a duty, doing a job, whatever. And we're letting God use us. And our main goal is to please God. In effect, we will be pleasing those around us. This, the you know, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's right now oblivious to the fact that God is doing all this. He just thinks, you know, these four guys, these are, these guys are awesome. But that's giving an invitation. That's softening a heart. As hard as his is. And we'll see later on, you know, he's going to build a statue of himself for everybody to worship. Mm. But God's providing an opportunity and softening a heart. Yeah. And also, like, how many Israelites were actually there, right? And Mm. this is a remnant of that remnant. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty interesting to, you know, think about. Like how many of them actually feared the Lord, Mm -hmm. right? And he only found the four, not saying that there wasn't others, you know what I mean. But like out of all those, the four really stood out to him. Right. So Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. And that's when the Persians come in. So in reading that, you know, it really really should cause us to look, you know, at our lives. You know, we may have some career that we're in. We may be in service of something, but we have to ask ourselves, have we made ourselves Christian first before those things? There is a way to live in the world and operate in the world, but not be a part of its system. Daniel's working for it. Yeah, he is serving God. And that's something we have to really ask ourselves. Are we serving God when we go to our job and do what we're doing? Are we serving God when we're living our life? Do we have that faith that surpasses all of these physical things, that surpasses, you know, what nation you're from, that surpasses what your social standing is, that surpasses, you know, what your nobility is, Our faith surpasses all these things. Do we make God first? Mm. And it's something that when I read, right? Because we have jobs, you know, we live in the world. Do we spend our time letting ourselves just being assimilated by it? Mm. Yeah, so like you were saying, are we living in the world and is the world um, molding us? Right. Or are we... So, yeah, are we living in the world and being a partaker of the world? Or are we living in the world and letting Christ mold us and shape us and just being that pilgrim seeking first the kingdom of God? Right. And that's just in the first chapter. Mm. And that's what I wanted to bring out today, just in that first chapter. And I think that we're going to close with that. And, hmm. I can't make any promises, but maybe the next episode will be in another chapter of Daniel. There's some good stuff in Daniel. There is. But as I can, we can make ideas and we can have a a plan. But part of our us and our walk is trying to let the spirit have his will and have his way. Mm. So as the spirit wills, you know, if it's of the spirit, if it's God's will for the next episode to be in another chapter of Daniel and praise God. But if it's somewhere else, praise God too. Yeah, and so with that, this was Wade. And this is Jen. 
And this was an Out of the Darkness Ministry podcast. Thank you very much for listening. God bless. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you need a Bible or if you know somebody who needs a Bible, you can go to our website. It's www.outofthedarknessministry.com.